Hi, everyone. We're going to get started with our last lecture that I have with you all, invasive fungal infections. Um, some of my favorite infections, honestly. So fungi are ubiquitous in the environment and even common colonizers of the human flora. So typically healthy individuals are not affected by these organisms. However, we become worried when there are individuals that, immuno that are immunocompromised and when it is that they have um, fungal infections. So that's when we become worried. So with the advancements of modern medicine, patients are able to overcome diseases and conditions such as cancer, organ failure, and autoimmune diseases. But these treatments can come with a price to the patient's immune system and then once again, leaving them very susceptible to once harmless fungi. This chapter will provide an overview of the major fungi found in invasive fungal infections and how it is that we manage these infections. So we're not gonna go through all of um, the fungal infections, just ones that can be invasive, meaning the ones you can see in the bloodstream and um, those that are gonna be really prominent. So at the conclusion of this, you all should be able to identify risk factors for candidemia, which is candida in the blood, for um, aspergillosis, which is aspergillus that may be in the blood or, or, in, the, or in the lungs, and coccidiodomycosis, and then you want to be able to list the most common organisms which cause candidemia, aspergillosis, and coccidiodomycosis. You want to determine factors which indicate starting empiric therapy. And then we want to, of course, learn how to de-escalate. And then what it is that we want to monitor in terms of safety and efficacy, because these drugs can have a lot of um, adverse effects and um, things that it is that we want to look for. Excuse me. Sorry about this, we're gonna scroll back up, okay. So then we have our abbreviations for um, all of the things that we will discuss. And then we are gonna go ahead and um, get started. So here I have first for you all to look at the three main classes of antifungal agents. So we have our triazoles, our polyenes, echinocandins, and then our other, which is our flucytosine, which is actually an anti-metabolite that we utilize with our polyene only. We do not use flucytosine alone. So with our triazoles, they're kind of easy to remember because they end in azole. So all of them will have that azole ending. We have fluconazole, which you guys saw when we talked about intra-abdominal infections and talked a little bit about anti-fungal therapy there. Isobuconazole, itraconazole, posaconazole, and then voriconazole, which I will probably refer to as vori moving forward. Then we have our polyenes, which is amphotericin B, echinocandins, which all end in that fungin. So we also um, talked briefly about mycofungin, but you can have indula fungin and caspo fungin. But with our polyenes, I would um, I recommend that you all do know these mechanisms of action. All in all, they all work in some type of way to go ahead and prohibit that um, function of the fungal cell wall. So when we think about bacteria, Fungal, um, antifungals do pretty much the same thing. They try to go ahead and block that formation of the, of the cell wall. So for polyenes, they bind to ergastrol, which is required to, um, which is a key component for the cell wall, and they cause the membrane disruption. Once they cause that, ending, that membrane disruption, you have an increase in permeability, and then you have leaking of the cytoplasmic contents. So it is fungicidal to most fungus. So um, Amphotericin B will oftentimes be our last line, and we'll go through specific therapies for specific um, disease states, but it'll often be our last line, and we know that for a fact, this amphotericin B is likely going to get that job done because it's going to be titled there. So it can be um, nephrotoxic, and you can have infusion reactions and then electrolyte wasting just, just be because of that increase in permeability and then that leaking of the cytoplasmic contents. So the mechanism of nephrotoxicity is due to direct tox toxicity to tubules and then also vasodilation of arteries, which can cause pre-renal AKI. So it's very important that you look out for this. If you have a patient that's already nephrotoxic, we may... Um, we really def we definitely have to access one one thing that I always talk to you about. So patient goals, and then two, can we do something else for this patient that doesn't include amphotericin because we know that that's going to be um really bad in terms of nephrotoxicity. So that's something that you definitely want to think about. So um you can use liposom liposomal formulations, and that is has been shown to reduce that incidence of um, the acute tubular necrosis. Nevertheless, patients can still present with um, nephrotoxicity despite using um, the liposomal formation. So um, sodium low with fluids before and after the amphotericin infusion increases intravascular volume and then prevents the pre-renal AKI. 
So oftentimes we will say you need to pre-medicate before, um, or not often, most times, all the time, before the use of polyenes or amphotericin B, you do wanna go ahead and medicate the patient. So that would include normal saline, and then um, also acetaminophen and diphenhydramine to decrease the incidence of infusion reactions, just because the amphotericin can really um, cause um, extra extravasation to the, um, to the patient when it is infused, so you wanna make sure that we pre-medicate them with the acetaminophen and diphenhydramine to prevent that reaction. And then also just that normal saline, because when you think about um, just that leakage of the contents and that in the vasodilation ultimately causing that pre-renal. When we think about vasodilation, right, we know that if we get fluids, that we can prevent that vasodilation from occurring and then ultimately that pre-renal AKI. And then also, um, you want to make sure, please remember this, with the polyenes, with the amphotericin B, you want to evaluate your electrolytes. You want to make sure that you're looking at your potassium, your magnesium, your phosphorus, your calcium, once again, because of that leakage of the cytoplasmic contents. So you want to watch electrolytes. You want to watch electrolytes. First thing you're looking for with this is electrolytes. This will be very important for you all. You will continue to see this throughout your life. So for our triazoles, our mechanism of action is they block the fungal cytochrome P450 dependent enzyme C14 alpha demethylase. Um, this enzyme decreases, this, this enzyme causes the conversion of anestrol to ergestrol. So if we block this, then you decrease the conversion of that. And then ultimately you decrease the membrane fluidity, the accumulation of the toxic sterols. And then um, our main goal here is to go ahead and prevent that cell growth and then that cell death. So triazoles are fungi static to most yeast and um, filamentous fungi, so that including the candida, the, um, candida species, but um, fungi cytal to aspergillus. So that means that in a lot of cases, the triazoles will be fungi static. So when we remember when we talked about bacterial static and bacterial cytal. So bacterial static, um, what it does is it tries to go ahead and, um, or fungi static anyway, they both the static part is kind of um, synonymous. It tries to um, bring down the inoculum or the bacteria or the fungi respectively enough so that your body's normal innate immune system can go ahead and carry out the rest. Fungi cytal, they, it completely wipes out what is there. Nevertheless, at certain concentrations, fungi static drugs can work in similar ways as fungi cytal drug, as, as fungi cytal drugs. So in this case, triazoles are fungi static to most yeast and then most Canada. But uh, when it, when you use a triazole against aspergillus, the drug of choice will actually be voriconazole. It will eliminate that aspergillus. So it also inhibits the cytochrome P450 of humans. So if it's working at a, cyto P4, a cytochrome P450 dependent enzyme, then we know that it's gonna be metabolized heavily through um, the liver. So that means that you guys wanna make sure that you're looking for um, major drug interactions with these drugs, with triazoles. Azoles, are, um, they, are, they heavily interact with um, drugs that are metabolized through the liver. They can cause significant hepatotoxicity. So that's definitely something you wanna look at. So several of these agents also exhibit nonlinear kinetics, that being voriconazole, itraconazole, and postoconazole. So that means that they may require pharmacokinetic monitoring. And what I mean by nonlinear, nonlinear is that um, every increase is not every increase that you make in a drug is not equivalent to that same type of increase in the person, meaning that um, there's a potential for the concentrations to be extremely higher in the person, despite um, maybe only increasing 100 milligrams or so. So you just want to be very careful with that and keep that in, in consideration. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, fluconazole and isobuconazole exhibit very similar pharmacokinetics or linear kinetics anyway. So major advice adverse events are hepatotoxicity, as we discussed, so um, you just want to make sure that you are aware of that. And then fluconazole is readily absorbed. So it has a very um, high bioavailability and can be switched from IV to oral very, very quickly due to that one-to-one uh, -one conversion. Fluconazole's conversion, meaning going from the um, IV formulation to the oral is one-to-one. -one. Do not forget that. That's important. So then we have our echinocandins. They inhibit the synthesis of beta 1, 3 diglucan, which is a very key and critical com component of that cell wall. So we know in different ways, all of these drugs work to go ahead and inhibit that cell wall formation. 
It is very well tolerated. Poor incidence of adverse effects, but can cause um, hepatotoxicity. Definitely not not at the rate in which the other drugs do go. Do um, cause it though. Um, Echinocans are pretty good drugs to utilize, and um, it is only IV formulation, so you want to limit the long term use. And then um, table six and seven really just give you a better depiction of the drugs. It lists everything out, side effects, and all of that. So for invasive fungal infections, um, these are caused by fungi that invade deep into the body's tissues. And then although these infections are less common than the superficial mycosis, so when you guys think about just maybe like athlete's foot and things like that, they cause severe infections and have increased mortality. So the burden and mortality of, of IFIs is likely underestimated as these are not reported to public health agencies. The four most common invasive fungal infections are crypto cryptoco crypto um, invasive candidiasis and then invasive aspergillosis and then um, PJP or pneumocytis um, pneumonia, which you all likely learned about in HIV or will learn about right after this right after this class in opportunistic infections. So below is a table categorizing the various types of invasive mycoses. So you guys can see um, the ones that are endemic, meaning they're in certain locations. So histoplasma, coxiodiodes, blastomyces, and then we have our yeast, which is candida, and then cryptococcus neoformans. And then we have our molds, um, and then our other, so pneumocystitis. So cryptococcus, cryptococcal meningitis, and then pneumocystitis are to be covered in the, the opportunistic um, infectious lecture, which you guys will dive more into that, but at least you know where it is that they fall. So invasive fungal infections are categorized as primary and then opportunistic. So primary means they develop following exposure to fungal spores or candida in the soil. And then when distributed can become aerosolized and then inhaled leading to infection. So typically these infections occur in immunocompromised patients, but they do have the capacity to go ahead and infect immunocompetent patients if they are exposed to a high inoculum of the organism. So a lot of times when you do see these fungal infections, they'll be in those patients that have cancer, that are on immunosuppressive therapies. But if you have a patient that's been hospitalized for a long time, then potentially um, they're not, like I said, they may be a bit compromised, but they're not able to like readily overcome the fungus the way that they typically would be. So that's why, um, or they may be exposed to a high inoculum of it, meaning a lot of that fungus because they're in a hospital setting and then they can become infected with it. These fungi can also reside in specific geographical area, areas and the most endemic fungi in the Central Valley. So when we think about California, it's coxidiodes species and the opportunistic infections. These fungi are encountered in mostly immunocompromised patients. The number of fungi which infect these patients is much wider in spectrum and most of them tend to be less virulent than the endemic. They rarely cause infection in immunocompetent patients and are often colonizers that are found in these patients, meaning that if you're immunocompetent, then PJP or, crypto, or um, cryptococcal infections, cryptococcus is something that you're not really worried about. And these infections are more difficult to diagnose, but may be fatal if not diagnosed early and then treated aggressively. So epidemiology, let's talk about invasive candidiasis, which honestly is pretty easy in the grand scheme. These infections are pretty um, straightforward. So Canada is the fourth most common um, bloodstream infection in the United States hospitals. The mortality of candidemia is 47% with even higher mortality in those patients that are septic. So in the, in the point, at the point in which the patients have become septic due to the, candid the um, candidemia, then we are very, very, very worried. So although candida infections more commonly occur in immunocompromised patients with febrile neutropenia, due to improved prophylaxis, the trend of candidemia is increasing in non-neutrophenic patients in the ICU, meaning that um, in those patients that may not necessarily have cancer and are immunocompromised, we are um, beginning to see candid candidemia in those patients as well. So it is very much um, becoming an in is very much becoming something that we are extremely worried about. Candida is. So the most common, the most common organisms that we see that are con that are um, causative of the candidiasis are um, Canada albicans. Canada albicans is a very um, prominent organism that we see, and then we can have non-Canada albicans, Canada species. So you have Canada species, 
And then you kind of have like a tree, like a breakdown. You have those, you have Canada albicans, which is a type of Canada species. And then you have other Canada species that is not Canada albicans. So you can have Canada glabrata, Canada crucii, Canada tropicalis, Canada para, parasipalis, um, and then so on and so forth. So there are more than 150 species of Canada, but these eight um, identifiers are our most important. So Canada albicans is still the most common Canada species, and it's one that um, a lot of research is really geared towards Canada albicans because as we stated, um, as we talked about the epidemiology, it's really becoming a super big deal. And then uh, we also have Canada glabrata and then Canada crucii, which is, um, these species are just of greater concern due to their dose dependency, um, do their dose dependent dosing for um, azoles, which can be used. And they are also for Canada crucii, it is intrinsically resistant to azoles. So um, we are very worried about that because that means that we have to, of course, scale up our therapy, right? If we want to treat someone empirically and we think and we don't know what candidate species that they're infected with, then we want to go with maybe an echinocandin because of the fact in certain disease states, because of the fact that Canada crucii or Canada glabrata may be present and they're not as responsive as Canada albicans is to our typical triazole therapies. So Canada albicans is a colonizer of the skin and then the female genital tract and most commonly of the GI tract in humans. So this is a major route of or source of infection and for um, deep-seated infections. So for Canada albicans, when we see it, we see it in that, uh, G we can see it in UTI infections and then the, U the GI tract, which is why we talked about it a little bit in our um, intra abdominal infection lecture and all of that. So the most common manifestation of Canada infections is oral candidiasis, but it can invade other, other areas of the body, such as the vascular system. It can cause bacteremias, endocarditis, peritonitis, arthritis, and then CNS in the um, infections or meningitis. So placement of the central line um, or receipt of multiple antibiotics is a risk factor. Make sure that you all are very clear on these risk factors, which honestly make a lot of sense. I think that you all will pretty much pick up a rhythm here. So if you have extensive surgery and burns, renal failure on hemodialysis, that hemodialysis can introduce the fungus. Um, mechanical ventilation that can introduce fungi, fungus there just from the buildup of when you are being ventilated. Prior fungal colonization, exposure to broad spectrum antibiotics, extensive exposure, meaning for a prolonged period of time. That's because you have a disruption in your normal flora. And then that fungus that was normally, um, that fungus that was normally regulated by the, by the normal flora and bacteria that was there is no longer able to be regulated, which means you can go ahead and have growth of the fungus there. If you're immunocompromised, meaning that you have immunocompromising disease states as listed here, and then if you underwent surgery, remember we talked about you have fungus that are in GI tract. So if you manipulate that GI tract, then you can potentially have um, a fungus infection that arises from that. So infections caused by Canada often appear similar to other um, general systemic infections, but the patients may present with sepsis or septic shock. So with the thing with these infections is that with fungus infections, one, they take a long time to identify because it takes a while for fungus to, um, to grow in the bottles that we use to identify different, um, different bugs that may be present. So that's a big thing. And then two, the issue is that um, because these because these infections are, um, because these fungus are really bad and very, very much detrimental to, um, to those that are infected with them, the progression of the infection is very quick. So it's very, it's very important that when it is that we know that these are present, that we treat them accordingly. So for laboratory testing, um, the culture of the site is a gold standard. So cultures from non-sterile sites may indicate colonization particularly in sputum or urine samples, you can get, um, it may uh, indicate that the patient may be colonized and not necessarily a true infection. So commonly these organisms are identified as yeast or budding yeast, hyphae or pseudo hyphae when cultured. So then we can also use 1,3 beta glucan detection. So beta glucan is a cell wall um, constituent of Canada, Aspergillus, PJP and other fungi. So this test simply detects the components of fungi and was approved as a diagnostic adjunctive to cultures. Actually, there's a lot of research in the way of the 1,3 beta-glucan testing, and it's kind of um, coming, 
it's kind of emerging as more of a goal is as more of our go to for detection, because it is able to go ahead and detect those components and it's able to do so more so than the blood culture so it's able to call those um, those infections that blood cultures may miss. So it is slowly but surely rising to the top there. So true positive results are not specific for invasive candidiasis, but rather suggest the possibility of an invasive fungal infection. So it may not be specific to Canada, but what it tells you is that some type of fungus, in there, fungus is there. You can occasionally have um, false positives and um, those false positives can, can be due to the gram positive or gram negative bacteremia, hemodialysis, colonization, or other things that may contain glucan. So then we can have our peptic nucleic, um, peptide nucleic ulcer or our, um, fish testing. And this uses PNA probes that target RNA from Canada albicans directly from the blood culture. It has good sensitivity, good specificity. This can be incredibly helpful in detecting candidemia, but it's not uh, widely available in hospitals yet. We do also have T2 Canada, which I knew that, which I know that um, Dr. F briefly talked about in his uh, diagnostics aspect of the course, but then T2 Canada is actually, um, it's kind of similar to Viragene in that it is designed to go ahead and detect the presence of um, five important Canada species, so Canada Albicans being a part of that, Canada Crucii, Canada Glaborata, um, Canada um, per Parasipolis, so those really prominent Canada organisms. And um, the T2 Canada has been compared to 1,3 beta glucan and then the um, blood culture testing. It's been shown that when you use the rapid diagnostic test in combination with other um, testings that you can get more of a positive result there as to those patients that are truly candidemic. So for diagnosis, you want to cultures of sterocytes to grow in Canada. Um, that is our gold, our gold standard for invasive candidiasis. And then you can have other um, non-culture diagnostics and that's due to the antigen, antibody, or beta to glucan assays, PCR testing, which are more common. And then so for therapy, you wanna give antifungals as prophylactic therapy for those patients that are high risk. And high risk are um, those patients that have undergone um, transplantation, so a liver transplant, those that are admitted to the ICU with recurrent um, intestinal perforations and or um, Anastomosis leak. So those patients, then you want to go ahead and um, give them prophylaxis therapy in the event that they require it. Their prophylaxis will likely look a lot like fluconazole unless the patient has been colonized with um, Canada Crucii previously, then you will maybe um, approach your therapy a bit differently from there. But that, that is a conversation for um, if you all become more immersed in ID, just know that you get prophylaxis to those patients that have received a transplant or have had some type of preparation, some people that have a GI leak, things of that sort. So for empiric therapy, um, preemptive therapy can be considered in patients with high risk factors of invasive candidiasis. So that means that they present with persistent signs and symptoms in clinical laboratory. Um, results, or they present with a 1,3 beta to glucan test or infection um, without mycological evidence of the or of infection, or those that are heavily colonized with Canada. So the decision to start empiric therapy on patients is not well distinguished. However, we do have things that guide us. So in hindsight, if you have a patient that if you treated them with antibiotic therapy and they continue to show signs of infection, then you will do um, a 1,3 beta to glucan test if that test is positive, or if you have a patient that has been heavily colonized with Canada, uh, meaning a lot of times this will be like our nursing home patients and, and our patients that may have febrile neutropenia and things like that, then we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll start antifungal therapy. Well, confirmed infection, antifungal therapy is appropriate to initiate when cultures grow positive for yeast. And it's important that these therapies are um, initiated immediately after the confirmation. And then um, this is what we want to do in terms of the, the therapeutic treatment for candida for invasive candidiasis. So in the event that they have candidemia and um, our first line agent that we will use is any kind of candid. If the patient is non neutropenic or neutropenic, the reason that we're using the kind of candy and not using the fluconazole is just because we're not exactly sure about what candida species it may be. 
Remember, we talked about how Canada Glabrata is dose dependent, how Canada Crucii is non-responsive. Then that means that we want to go ahead and use an echinocandin, which will be able to cover for those organisms too. So in the event that those organisms are present, we're not under treating the patient, right? So then um, alternatively, we can use fluconazole, we can give a load, and then we can treat them daily. This is in patients that are not critically ill, no prior history of azole exposure or no azole resistance. And then um, we can use amphotericin B. Remember I told you all, that's kind of our last line, but we use that in the event that they're not, um, they're intolerant to the other drugs. So we kind of can in first, because we don't know if resistance is there. Fluconazole maybe if there's no, if they're not critically ill, no history of resistance. And the amphotericin B if they can't take the other drugs. But for bone and joint, you can use fluconazole or you can use the kind of candy. And then we want to follow it up by fluconazole. The reason why we're considering um, the fluconazole first for bone and joint in any event that they, in the event that the patient has some type of resistance or um, things of that, then we can, of course, approach it a different way. But let's say resistance is not an issue. We want to use fluconazole just because of the fact that we don't know um, how long we'll have to treat the patient. We know for bone and joint infections, we have to treat for a long time. So we want to get them on PO therapy as quickly as possible. And we know with fluconazole, the bioavailability is one to one, very easy to go ahead and get on PO therapy quickly. If the patient has severe infection, then um, endocarditis or meningitis, then we will go ahead and use that um, infotericin B. Uh, the alternative for endocarditis, you can use an echinocandin, but you cannot use echinocandins for the meningitis infection because it does not penetrate the CSF. So it's not an alternative for that site. And then in the event that the patient has um, a UTI, so whether that be cystitis or pyelonephritis caused by um, Canada first line, you can use fluconazole in the event that it is fluconazole resistant, then we can use the amphotericin B. So non-pharmacological therapy, when we want to treat these patients, we want to remove or replace any central catheters because we know that fungus can colonize there on those um, catheters and then cause infection. We want to obtain daily or every other day um, cultures until we have a, a, ne a negative culture. And then we want to do an ophthalmology exam. Remember we talked about with bacteria, how bacteria like to go and they like to go to certain places and live there. So fungus, they like to go and um, they like to go into the eyes. And that's how we can see if someone has a true um, fungus infection is if you can see it in their, um, you can see it in their, in their eyes, in their irises, you can see the, um, the fungus there. So um, oftentimes with the diagnosis of, of fungal infections and in the guidelines, it recommends that an ophthalmology exam is conducted. So we wanna make sure that we are doing that with the fungal infections. In the event that the patient has candida, candida urea, then we want to replace any urinary catheters. And um, Canada is often a colonizer at this site, so it doesn't necessarily require treatment, but should be treated if they have other symptomatic, um, other if they have other symptoms and there are no other potential causes. So what I mean by this is. Um, we can have fungus in our urine, our, our urine, and that fungus can be a candida species. And that's okay. We're okay with that. If you have a patient and um, they have fungus in their urine and um, there's no other, there's, there's, they're not looking, it's not looking like a bacteria can be a cause, but you see that they're presenting with a high temperature, high respiratory rate, clear signs of them being infected, then you want to say, okay, let's treat this candida in the urine for this reason. And then candida in the sputum, so um, a reduction in that colonization will, will, be, will be done in the event that you, um, with, when you extubate the patient, if the patient is intubated and then Canada is often a colonizer in the airway and it doesn't require treatment. So once again, if you have a patient and they're not responding to any type of um, antibiotic treatment or it doesn't look like a bacteria may be, um, a bacteria may be causative, then you treat that patient. Um, with with the um, with the respiratory infection with a um, antifungal therapy, that is the time when you do that. You can have candida in your lungs, you can have candida in your urine, and that may not be a significant worry unless the patient becomes immunocompromised or in the event that there's nothing else to explain why the patient continues to worsen. So for follow up for definitive therapy, step down therapy can be done once you have susceptibilities. So following that, um, that empirical chart, you can step down once you have your susceptibilities available. 
So triazoles are definitive um, therapies. You can, for our first line, is fluconazole, or you can step down to fluconazole. Fluconazole is the preference that the patient can take it because then you can then get them on the PO therapy. So um, IDSA guidelines recommend the de-escalation to fluconazole or another triazole five to seven days if cultures have been confirmed susceptible. The most common Canada species grown in cultures is Canada albicans, which is still very sen sensitive to fluconazole. So that's a really good thing that we like to hear. Canada glabrata is considered to be dose dependent. So that means it's susceptible to fluconazole, but requires higher dosing depending upon the minimum inhibitory concentration. So remember, uh, we have that question of, well, if something is resistant, uh, why is it that we would use high, a higher dose of the drug? Well, it's the hope that um, the higher dose will be able to saturate, um, in this case, that cell wall and still allow for the drug to work against the Canada glabrata. So it is dose dependent. For Canada crucii, it is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole. Therefore, when you do um, de-escalate to a definitive therapy, then you want to utilize another agent. Duration of therapy for candidemia, two weeks after documented clearance of symptoms. If it's osteoarticular infection, six to 12, septic arthritis, four weeks, and then for pyelonephritis, um, we can treat for two weeks. So invasive aspergillosis, this is the second most common invasive fungal infection organism most commonly um, affects, this organism most commonly affects those patients that have, um, that are immunocompromised or that have um, acute myeloid leukemia and those that undergo um, hematic stem, trail, stem cell tr um, transplantation and have prolonged neutropenia. So the crude mortality is about 80 to 90 percent of those with AIDS and bone marrow transplantation. So a lot of times when you do see those patients um, and they do have a fungal infection, it will be aspergillus. So these are the most common, um, commonly identified species. And these organisms are identified as a saphiritic molds, which can be found around the world and ubiquitous molds that can be found in soil, water, and then decaying vegetation. So aspergillosis is a broad term, which encompasses many different types of diseases from allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis invasive disease. And then aspergillus is generally required, is generally acquired by inhalation of just airborne um, conidia or spore in, or aspergillus spores, which can settle in the alveoli and then the peronasal sinuses. These organisms most commonly invade the lungs and the sinuses, and then that's how they go ahead and cause severe infection. That can also involve the central nervous system. So allergic manifestations occur with recurrent episodes of severe asthma, which can progress disease, the disease fibrosis and then bronchiostasis with um, granuloma formation. So aspergillus conida are trapped in um, viscous mucosis from asthmatic patients and then grow and produce toxins and antigens. So this can result in an immuno immunologic IgE mediated reaction, and that can cause bronchospasm, eosinophilia, and then skin reactivity. So fibrosis and pulmonary filtrates are mediated by participating antibody um, complexes of IgG antibodies, followed by granuloma formation and then mononuclear infiltration, which is caused by type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reactions. Atherogelioma occurs due to a saphiritic colonization and previous abnormal sinus tissues Aspergillus hyphae mat together, and then they cause a big fungus fall. And then this infection is localized to the sinuses and can appear as nice drainage or brownish mucus plugs. Fungus balls can also seed into the lungs and cavities caused by previous diseases, like tuberculosis, lung tumors. And then patients typically experience chest pain, chest pain, this uh, sputum collection, and then hemo, hemo hemoptysis, right? So allergic manifestations can include symptoms similar to severe asthma, so wheezing, malaise, weight loss, chest pain. These are usually secluded in the lungs and really do cause invasive aspergillosis. So there's times where, where um, patients that have certain disease states, so like asthma, they can have aspergillus that are, that are in their lungs as described, but it may not necessarily be invasive. Um, be invasive to the, to the individual or may not cause the presentation of invasive aspergillosis. So invasive aspergillosis occurs when there, is, when there are impaired um, host defenses, particularly 
The neutrophils, monocytes, and macrophages are the main defenses against the aspergillus. The aspergillus. So the lungs are the most common site for invasive disease and is characterized by vascular invasions leading to thrombosis, infraction, necrosis of the tissue, and then dissemination into the tissues or the organs or the, or the organs. So you can have the allergic manifestations or um, the aspergillus that's caused due to the asthma. And then there's the recurrence of um, the recurrence of the presence of the aspergillus there. Invasive aspergillosis is when the aspergillus then, then goes into the lungs and then and other um, and then goes to other tissues or organs. So um, that's when we are worried. So the way that invasive aspergillosis happens is when the host defenses are impaired. And by their the host defenses being impaired, that means when they have maybe a decline in neutrophils, decline in monocytes, decline in macrophages that are able to protect the host against the aspergillus. So risk factors can include those that would be immunocompromising. And then of course that broad spectrum antibiotic use, do not forget that very big part because you disrupt your normal flora there. And then laboratory testing, um, bronchoscopy or um, a bronchoavular lavage. So they're only positive in 40% of identified species. And then the blood, CSF, and bone marrow are really positive. But what you can do is use a galactomannan test, which um, actually tests for the antigen release from aspergillus hyphae upon that um, invasion of the host tissue. So it's obtained in serum, bronchilo, avular, lavage fluid, and then the um, cerebral spinal pleural fluid. And then the sensitivities range from, range from 30 to 100%, and then the specificity is about 85%. So um, specificity is important, and this is one thing that we'll talk about in class, and then also um, you guys will have talked about it at least in your um, in your biostats class. So specificity is good, right? Because it lets us know at least definitively this particular bug or this particular fungus is not there. So that's why it's also good. And then you can have false positives in those patients that do have, um, that are receiving cyclophosphamide or piptazole, and that's because they also have galactamannan um, products in them. And then um, for you can use a 1,3 beta deglucan, beta deglucan detection, and this can also be positive and um, invasive aspergillosis, but it can be positive in other fungal infections. So we talked about 1,3 beta deglucan for invasive candida, right? So if you use that for invasive Canada, then potentially if you test the patient, it can tell you that fungus is present there, but it may not never necessarily tell you aspergillosis, which would be a problem because the way that we would treat a Canada infection is different than the way we would treat the aspergillosis. So then we also have our imaging and then that imaging will present with a halo sign around it in the person's lungs. So you can definitely tell lungs of a patient that has aspergillosis. And then for late invasive aspergillosis, the chest x-ray will show diffuse pulmonary infiltrates, nodules, consolidation, and then demonstrate wedge-shaped um, pleural cavity lesions. So the diagnosis of aspergilliomas in the lungs, um, you have a chest x-ray that shows a solid round mass of watery density within a spherical cavity. So it's just um, your chest cavity, then you'll see a mass, and that mass will look like it has a halo above it. And then um, for invasive aspergillosis, we want to repeat the culture and the microscopic findings of tissue, but the most accepted diagnosis is the, is the clinical imaging plus the symptoms. So you want to be able to see those lungs. You want to be able to see the halo there in those lungs. And then, of course, um, you want to, if the patient has symptoms that, as previously described, so the cough and the wheezing, the progression to the other organs and tissues. So for prophylaxis, um, we can use a so prophylaxis is in special populations. So those patients that have received transplants, because as we talked about, those are the patients where um, aspergillosis can be most present because they have a, a decline in their immune system. And then um, the, prophyla the prophylactic agent of choice would be posaconazole or the amboriconazole. And then you can also consider um, any kind of kind, any kind of candy monotherapy as prophylaxis. But typically you would do the, the voriconazole, honestly. So for pharmacotherapy, our drug of choice for um, aspergillosis, I'm going to say this seven times, <laughs> a drug of choice for aspergillosis are triazoles. And our first line, our first line is voriconazole. Do not forget that. 
Boriconazole is our first line drug against atrogeliosis unless there is some reason the patient cannot take it. So alternatively, we can give posaconazole, we can give isobiconazole, and then alternatively, we can give amphotericin B, like we said, very much reserved and um, utilized for salvage therapy. Echino, we can give, we can consider echinocandins, excuse me, as combination therapy. So echinocandins have in vitro data to support coverage. But they have not successfully treated aspergillus infections as monotherapy. So that means that if the patient is not responding to the boricanos, you can consider adding echinocandin there, but do not use the echinocandin alone because the in vitro activity is a lot better than what we actually see when we treat the patient. And then for adjunctive therapy, we can reduce or eliminate the immunosuppressive agents. And then also uh, we can consider giving colony stimulating factors. So the biggest thing with this, we see it a lot in like you said, hematic stem cell transplant. transplant. We see it in those patients that have um, undergone um, bone, marrow, bone marrow transplants and things like that. And that's because with our stem cells, they provide us with our, with our um, with our myocytes, with our uh, macrophages and all of those things that are able to protect us against um, aspergillus. So in the event that you have these cancers and those are wiped out, then you end up being more susceptible to contracting um, aspergilliosis. So that's why we wanna reduce the immunosuppressive agent so that we can have these things that can overcome the infection. And then also that's why we wanna consider colony stimulating factors, which can increase the amount of neutrophils, macrophages and so on and so forth that, so forth that we have. So the duration of therapy for um, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is about six to 12 weeks. So you treat them for a long time. So finally, we have coxiodiodomycosis. So of the estimated 150,000 50, infections that occur annually, 50,000 likely produce an illness that's warranted for, for medical attention. So a lot of times these, are, um, these can resolve without any true worry. So 10,000 to 20,000 of these infections are reported, 2,000 to 3,000 produce pulmonary sequela, and then 600 to 1,000 spread hemat hematinogously from the lungs and become disseminated. So this is also known as the San Joaquin Valley fever due to its endemic region, so being found in that area. So endemically, Coxy, and I'll continue to call this Coxy, lives in dust and soil in the areas of the Southwest region, including California, so this is the most in, this is the most common endemic mycosis in the Central Valley areas, as shown as established by endemic prevalence in that map that is below. You guys can find that there. So the most causative organisms are um, listed here: so Coxiodiotes, Imidis, and then um, or Coxio posa, posa but it was renamed to Imidis. So it's dimorphic, meaning that it's, it, can, it can exist in two forms. So either yeast or mold, and it can depend on the growth and temperature. So at higher temperatures, it can be a yeast, and then at lower, it can be a mold. And then it lives in areas where this is scant, where it's scant annual rainfall, hot summer, sandy, what we think about when we think about the Central Valley, right? So during the dry season, um, resistant optical can canadia form and become airborne when the soil is disturbed, when an individual comes into contact with this contaminated soil during ranching, dust storms, or proximity to construction sites, then they can transform into um, those things where endospores, where they can be transferred and cause endospores. These endospores are released when um, these, the organisms reach maturity and then an acute inflammation response leads to tissue infiltration and our mononuclear cells resulting in our granulomal formation or the formation of this organism. This more commonly affects patients with impaired immune systems as previously described our fungal um, disease states. However, it can also be present in those that are immunocompetent. It may just be a less severe infection. So how we talk about um, these don't commonly become severe infections, they are severe in the event that the patient is immunocompromised. That's more, that's what we'll see that at. So um, risk factors are those individuals that um, include, can include those individuals of a certain race, but when we're thinking about equity, let's think about the individuals that are likely located in this area, that are likely working in this area where they would be able to inhale these spores. So we see um, Filipino individuals, African-Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic, 
individuals, Asian individuals. So these are those people that would be essential workers working in these areas where the where the coxie reside and they can become infected. And um, and also they 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 are those that may be represented amongst individuals that are immunocompetent. So then um, we see that it's mostly minoritized individuals that um, can suffer from these where the, the risk the risk factors are higher for those that are a part of these minoritized races. And then um, for pregnancy, those in, if individuals have um, are infected during their second or third trimester, if they're receiving any type of immunosuppressant therapy, as listed here, if individuals have AIDS, if they are male gendered, if they are neonates. So um, for clinical presentation, and then here is just how it's transmitted, and then it has our uh, our map here where we see this organism often. So although approximately one third of the population in endemic areas is infected, the average in incidence of systemic disease is only about 0.43%. So it's very low that you see um, this actually become a true disseminated disease. And coccidiomycosis typically presents as a primary uncomplicated respiratory tract infection and it often results spontaneously, but it is rare as we stated that it does become a disseminated infection. So approximately 60% of patients have asymptomatic self-limited infections. 40% may exhibit general signs, and that could be fever, chills, cough, headaches, or throat. Symptoms usually occur one to three weeks after exposure. And then some, some patients with coccidiotal um, infection present may have that present with dermatologic or rheumatologic implant, complaints. So dermatologic would be the diffuse and then the mild erythroderma or a maculopapular rash. And then for the um, rheumatological, it could be arthralgias, multiple joints, um, symmetrical, typical lower joints, just um, joint issues, um, joint, joint pain that they may describe. And then also they will describe um, an association with a persistent cough and then night sweats. So this is often something if we have patients that come in and we know that night sweats can also be um, equated to tuberculosis, which if you guys haven't heard about that yet, you will likely be hearing about an opportunistic infections aspect of the course. But um, we also wanna make sure um, in this population that we are testing them for the coccidiomycosis as well as the TB because the night sweats can be consistent amongst the both of them. So with the disseminated disease, it occurs in about 1% of patients. Most common dissemination is in the skin, lymph nodes, bone, and then the meninges. Meningitis can um, occur in about 16% of, of the disseminated disease, and it involves very nonspecific specific symptoms, as we know meningitis can, so headache, weakness, altered mental state, neck stiffness, and so on and so forth. So for laboratory testing, you can test for... Um, we use enzyme amino assays, IgM testing, and then IgG testing. So we know IgM and IgG tell us if the person has been affected acutely or then if they've been chronically infected. And then we can also test the blood and then a CSF culture in the event that it becomes disseminated into the meninges. So we, we know that from our chart how you can tell different type of meningitis infections, whether it be viral, bacterial, or then fungal. And then we can also get a bronchoscopic um, specimen or we can get cultures from there. And um, they're better for diagnosing just the early coccidiomycosis. And then they, are, they can also be used for the um, histopathological identification of the disseminated disease. Or for imaging, it may show um, single or multiple dents um, infiltrates. And then for diagnostics, we typically will use a serological testing as our most common way, but then you can also use our culture for diagnosing. And then patients with neurological signs and symptoms should undergo a lumbar puncture because we know that meningitis can be a um, major presentation here. So when you do your lumbar, you get the um, diagnostic test for the CSF. Then you test to see whether it, whether it is um, that pathogen that's causative. So therapy, any patient requiring hospitalization, um, therapy is indicated for the patients that require hospitalization, meaning they have severe symptoms or they have an exacerbation of their comorbidities due to the active coxy infection. Um, patients that are ambulatory with any of these following symptoms, and then patients that have comorbidities of um, diabetes or who are otherwise frail. So we'll treat these patients 
in the event that the patients don't present with this, meaning that they aren't presenting with any active symptoms, then we'll go ahead and like I said, more often than not, it will spontaneously resolve. So um, for first line, in the event that it's uncomplicated, um, we will treat them with fluconazole. First line, if it's meningitis, you will still treat them with fluconazole. And then, um, but you will use that higher dosing of the fluconazole. Um, for severe infection, limb threatening, um, vertebral disease, then we'll do amphotericin B. And then eventually, once um, the patient begins to resolve, we will go ahead and treat them with the azole therapy. And then if the patient is pregnant, we would do the amphotericin B and then go to the azole. Um, well, excuse me, we would not consider the azole because it is teratogenic, especially in the first trimester, and that's really because of that CYP-P450 inhibition there. And um, those enzymes are very necessary to the development of baby. So in the event that you inhibit that, that becomes an issue. So um, non-pharmacological non therapy, so surgery is indicated in special populations, including patients with cavity um, cavitary lesions and vertebral um, coccy infections. So that's when they'll have to have the surgery. Duration of therapy is about three to six months. It can be longer based upon the clinical uh, response. And then if the patient has meningitis caused by coccy, then they're treated for life, meaning they remain on that suppressive fluconazole therapy. So here's just a chart for you all to go through. I'm not asking that you memorize this. If I mentioned it previously, that's what's important. Um, so like the, the dosing for the fluconazole, the, the adverse events we'd be worried about with the azoles and um, all of that information, you, wanna, you want to know that. You want to know about that. That's going to be very important for you all. Mechanisms of action are going to be important. Um, and definitely knowing about the electrolytes in terms of the um, in terms of the polyenes. And then you want to remember that echinocandins are not renally adjusted. That's super important because you will have those patients that do have the renal issues and you want to know what drug can we use here. Do we have to renally adjust? And then all of that. But then make sure that you all are just um, that you that you understand about the contraindications, that you understand um, about what the azoles are. Are they inhibitors? Are they inducers? I want you all to be able to, to know that and how it is that you navigate that. But other than that, that is it for invasive fungal infections. And um, I'm excited to talk about this with you all. Okay.